Well, we discussed this at some length in chapter 13. Uh, and uh, the role that we see for those sorts of complementary uh, trade measures uh, is one of supporting the uh, international effort to, to put mitigation together. And we suggest that uh, um, there needs to be very clear rules about, about that. Uh, uh, there's quite a head of steam in Europe and the United States now about putting in place alongside their mitigation regimes uh, uh, tariffs on imports from countries that don't have strong mitigation regimes. Uh, it was part of the one leap before the uh, US Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago, or still before the, the Congress. Um, it's part of the European Union's proposal uh, for uh, uh, post-2012 uh, uh, arrangements. Um, there is some danger uh, that if every country does its own thing on that, uh, then it will become just a general part of the protectionist uh, uh, story, uh, become an excuse just to hold out imports and won't be closely related to the uh, emissions reduction story. So to ensure that any actions along those lines are closely focused uh, on the emissions objective, uh, we suggest there needs to be a uh, uh, World Trade Organization uh, 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 decision on these matters, setting down rules uh, for what you can do so you constrain uh, the, the protectionist trappings that would inevitably uh, come in uh, behind something done for uh, environmental reasons uh, if you didn't have these uh, constraints. But we think uh, that so long as that structure is right, there is a place for such measures uh, in support of uh, uh, moving towards a global agreement. Please the front. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Russell. Um, in your submission to <coughs> your draft report, there's 272 references to coal, which is perfectly appropriate. It's our second largest climate forcing. Um, what I can't work out is why you have ignored our largest climate forcing that causes more radiative forcing than all of our coal-fired power stations, and that's our livestock industries. Why has that been, been relegated to a glossary entry in the report? Uh, we, we will have a chapter on uh, agriculture and forestry in the final report. Uh, we don't have it in the draft report because uh, uh, the, the work hasn't been completed. And as we say in the draft report, that's not an indication of the importance of agriculture and forestry, which uh, have very great opportunities for sequestration as well as uh, being sources of emissions. Uh, but we'll be dealing with that in the, uh, in the final report. Uh, David Noonan, Australian Conservation Foundation. Professor, in your international low emission technology commitment, you specifically include so-called Generation 4 nuclear reactor systems that are largely plutonium breeder reactors based on the plutonium fuel cycle. Given that we need safe, sustainable and secure energy systems in the future, why do you propose public funding for high-risk nuclear, not just with unresolved waste management, but potentially with reactors on based on plutonium for maximising nuclear proliferation and nuclear weapons capabilities risks? Well, we think the uh, commitment should be a commitment to low emissions technology and whatever else uh, it might be. Uh, nuclear energy is a low greenhouse gas emissions technology. Uh, where uh, uh, we recognise the, well, I recognise the, uh, the proliferation risks. Uh, they have to be handled in other ways uh, outside the uh, emissions uh, regime. Uh, we're not taking a position in the in the uh, low emissions uh, commitment on all of that. A lot of the rest of the world uh, sees nuclear energy as part of the story of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's important part of the story uh, in Europe. Um, in China, uh, uh, the, with a huge growth in, uh, uh, in, in energy supply and demand uh, in the period ahead, they're expecting that 6% uh, of uh, electricity will come from nuclear by uh, 2020. The rest of the world is uh, doing that. I think we can't uh, ignore that as being part of the world's uh, um, story of uh, low emissions energy. Person at the front. Uh, Eric Harrop, uh, Executive Director of Widdersell. Um, Professor, I'd like to commend you and your team on the uh, first draft. Um, 
you mentioned earlier the South Australian government's uh, uh, leadership in the wind power area. Uh, the last few weeks, I was in Denmark. Uh, they're currently targeting double the uh, wind output to South Australia, and I think in the next 10 years it'll be 200% uh, higher. So they're talking 40% sustainable energy uh, within 10 years. some kind of incentives to grow this industry. I mean, South Australia has 600 kilometres of coastline that offer pretty good wind pressure uh, for this uh, sustainable energy. Um, also, uh, you made a comment about secondary grids. I'd just like to put a bit of a plug on our company. We actually make fresh water from the sea and groundwater, and we can sustain about 600 coastal communities in Australia. Um, I'd like to see some incentives there. Um, uh, you mentioned grids. Uh, there is no need to run uh, extensive grids to these coastal communities without offer. Uh, we can completely sustain these communities. And we're talking savings of uh, billions of dollars with uh, a bit of innovation which uh, we offer. Thank you. Yes, uh, the report does talk about the savings in transmission from decentralised power and uh, notes that a rational pricing system would recognise that uh, in, in pricing uh, of electricity. Um, certainly I acknowledge that uh, decentralised communities don't need transmission lines to them. It will often be uh, more cost effective to provide them with decentralised sources uh, of power. But when you've got large uh, opportunities for uh, renewable energy production a long way from major demand sources and a lot of the uh, wind opportunity in South Australia is of that kind, the, the geothermal in remote parts of the state is certainly of that kind, uh, then you can't uh, get away from the, uh, the need for uh, improved transmission systems. 